All right, so let's get underway. And it's our pleasure to welcome Stephen Ryan from the University of Saskatchewan. And he will be talking to us about generalized hyperpolygons, meromorphic Higgs bundles on curves, and integrability. Thanks. Uh, I thank uh, Peter and Jeremy for uh, inviting me to this very uh, interesting and well-organized conference. So what I'm going to be telling you about is joint work, uh, mostly with uh, Laura Shaposnik. The main objects that I'm going to be telling you about are uh, what we call hyperpolygons or uh, generalized hyperpolygons, uh, and uh, eventually their relationship to Higgs bundles. So this talk will be you know, more or less a, a broad overview. And uh, this is all with a view to discussing integrable systems on these spaces. And uh, there's actually a lot of uh, contact, maybe serendipitously, with what uh, Alex just spoke about in his talk. I mean, these spaces are, if you like, examples, at least on the Higgs branch side of what he was speaking about. And uh, we'll also be making contact with the same integrable system that he was just speaking about at the end of his talk. So uh, that works out nicely. Um, and in some sense, the basic ingredient here are flag varieties. And so that's where I'll start, but I'll take the point of view of them similarly to Alex as, as quiver varieties. And so just to ensure we're on the same page, I wanna start uh, just with some mechanics about quiver varieties. Um, just to, again, uh, make sure we're, we're all squared up with, uh, with this. And, you know, essentially you can understand a quiver variety by understanding, uh, you know, just a, a single arrow in the diagram. So here I have an arrow uh, pointing from one node to another. Um, let's call those nodes U and V. And they're labeled by elements of a dimension vector, just as like Alex was talk. So these are... Um, these are, if you like, non-negative integers, uh, r sub u and r sub v. And once you have those labels in place, you can define a representation of the arrow in the usual way to be linear maps from CRU to CRV. And I'm doing the same thing as Alex, I'm doing algebraic geometry over the complex numbers. And this is essentially ordinary quivers right here, but uh, I'm interested in uh, the Nakajima approach. So for every arrow that you see, we're gonna double it with an arrow going in the uh, reverse direction. Now I interpret the representation space as the cotangent space to the original Hom space. And you can think of this as having two components, X and Y, the original label and now uh, Y is labeling the backwards uh, direction. And you, you should think of that as being a cotangent vector at X. Okay. Now, uh, for each such doubled quiver, you can associate two functions in a natural way. I'll call them mu and nu. They both go from uh, the whole representation space of the quiver, which is really just direct sums of these T star reps. And they go to um, a direct sum of unitary um, uh, Lie algebras uh, summed over the, uh, the nodes in our quiver. That's for mu. And then for, uh, for nu, uh, we're summing over the nodes again, but now uh, full GL uh, Lie algebra. And of course, you'll recognize just the structure of these right away as moment maps. These are moment maps for natural uh, change of basis group actions on these quiver representations. And because we're, we're running over the nodes, we can build these moment maps node by node in a predictable way. So again, let's take this model arrow here and um, and work with it. So the component of the real moment map mu, uh, let's say contributed by the node u, is going to use this data x and y in the following way, where this just means, where this asterisk just means conjugate transpose. And this doesn't, you know, morally live quite in the correct Lie algebra, but I've rescaled it uh, appropriately, and that makes no difference to us in the end. So you just pretend that this lives in the correct algebra. And then uh, the complex valued moment map at that same node uh, is just the product uh, x, y in this order. Okay. And again, you can build from this recipe, you can build the entire moment map uh, in each case. Now, once we have the quiver and its moment maps, we can construct an affine hyperkähler variety. This is the Nakajima quiver variety of the quiver Q. And so roughly speaking, I form a group by taking the product of all the general linear groups 
associated to the nodes. And roughly speaking, I want a quotient T star rep Q by the action of this group. Of course, only, only roughly speaking, uh, because this, um, this won't be a nice quotient in general. I want to uh, take some kind of quotient. I'm going to take the hyperkähler quotient at a particular level uh, that I'm going to call alpha. And alpha is in the center of the algebra associated to the group. And you'll notice that I, I actually replaced this with the compact group. I'm essentially taking a, a symplectic quotient, uh, but with respect to uh, these two moment maps, um, so what I've done is I fixed a level set of mu and a level set of nu. I'm taking the level set of nu at zero and I'm using this central element alpha to define the fiber of mu. And I take their intersection and that'll be the hyperkähler quotient. And if you like the i, j, and k complex structures, i comes from mu and j and k come from the complex one. And I've also modded out by the trivial part of the group. But this is in general a recipe for constructing a Nakajima quiver variety. So to give you a uh, quite a concrete example and one that's very important to the objects that we want to motivate here is just to consider a, um, a flag variety um, well, which arises from choosing an A-type quiver. And so this is an equa-oriented A-type quiver. Uh, Alex's was not. He was a bit fancier with his arrow directions, but as he said, it doesn't really matter in the end. So what I've done is I've labeled uh, this uh, A-type quiver. It has uh, M nodes and I've labeled them starting from one and ending with some integer R. And so that means um, that M is less than or e equal to R in this case. And then I have a strictly ascending uh, sequence of integers in between. So I, I'm gonna refer to the vector of, the, this, of these labels, this dimension vector as R with uh, an underline. And so if you like that's some subset of the numbers one through R, but I, I definitely want to have one and R. So the Nakajima quiver variety is a quite a standard example uh, associated to this quiver is uh, T star of, uh, of the partial flag variety for, for this uh, vector of, of integers. I didn't have the red arrows and it would just be the, the partial flag variety. And this is uh, all done with a generic choice of uh, central element. So just to uh, make this more precise. So uh, the group here is a uh, kind of product of these uh, unitary groups, but I'm not taking the one at the end because uh, I want a positive dimensional variety. I'm not taking the one for the highest uh, dimension element. So that's how I've constructed the group. And then the central element that I'm taking is going to come from uh, all of the nodes except for the one with the largest label. And I'm taking all of these uh, elements to be zero except for the one associated to, uh, to the first node, the one labeled one. And that I can just regard as an element of, of the real numbers. And so I'm choosing this particular number to be non-zero. And I've also you know, labeled the arrows in a, in a consistent way, which will become important later. So there's a, a remaining UR action on this quiver because I didn't use the, the far um, left of the diagram. And it comes with its own complex moment map, uh, which is just the product of uh, these two arrows here. And its image based on the moment map uh, conditions being in these particular fibers forces uh, this to be no potent. And uh, when this is, uh, when the labeling is the complete flag, this is exactly the Springer resolution that uh, Alex uh, mentioned in his talk. Now I do want to use that UR action in defining a quiver variety. And so, you know, it would kill a single A type quiver, but uh, the game we can play is to interlace uh, sufficiently many, let's say N of these A type quivers. And this forms a so-called star-shaped quiver. So I have n different um, A-type arms, uh, all interlaced at the at the center here, and they need not have the same flag. Although it's it's common to take the the same flag, um, but you don't have to. And uh, these uh, so-called star-shaped quivers, they they appear in exactly you know the symplectic duality. They're a good example of things you can compute with um, symplectic duality in the sense of uh, Alex's talk. 
Um, they come up in the Delin Simpson problem um, for sort of conjugacy classes, um, the conjugacy class additive problem. Uh, and this, uh, the approach to it using star shaped quivers is due to Crawley Bouvie. And, um, and for us, these will come up as, uh, as spaces giving rise to hyperpolygons, which you'll see in a second. Now, unlike um, Alex's talk, we do allow loops and multi edges. So in fact, I want to consider what's called a comet shaped quiver. So I want to attach G many loops to the center of this figure. And so if you want to see the comet, you, know, you can sort of you know, change the, uh, the way you draw the, the quiver a bit. And uh, so these were the arms uh, trailing behind this part and hence the name comet. And uh, just to keep the conventions uh, sort of straight, we have um, a dimension vector for each of these A-type arms. I'll call them R1 through Rn. I fix a, a parameter alpha 1 through alpha n for each one um, that defines the associated partial flag variety. You can think of these as, as choices of Kähler moduli, if you like. And uh, these, these individual arrows will have x and y labels as per usual. But the, uh, the loops, and, and each solid loop gets doubled uh, as per the uh, Nakajima convention. I'll label these uh, as A's and B's, A's for the original and B's for the cotangent directions. OK. So I'm going to restrict without any cost, really, to an SUR action at the center. Uh, but I am going to use that action now to define a quotient. Uh, so I'm going to define the Nakajima query variety of the whole comet, but fortunately we don't need to start from scratch. I mean, you could, but um, really this is reduction in stages. And what I have is a, a cotangent bundle of a partial flag variety for each of my n arms. And then the, the matrices, uh, the A matrices uh, on the loops, uh, these are in SLRC. There are G of them and then T star because we've doubled them. I'm really taking this whole just simple Cartesian product and taking a hyperkähler quotient by the action at the center. And I'm taking that at level zero. Just remembering that uh, the, the alphas are encoded in the partial flag varieties. So I want to examine this uh, quotient a little bit more closely. So the, the asterisk here, the star is, this, is that central node um, in the quiver. And I have, again, n arms on the outside. They're indexed by i. And then the j's are indexing my loops. Now, um, you know, I don't really need to remember the m's. I'm just going to interact with the edges that are closest to the center. So I'll suppress those and just label these xi through uh, xi and yi. And then the moment maps at the center uh, look as follows. So um, the real moment map in terms of the, this data um, is given by a sum through the, the arms of uh, xi, xi uh, conjugate transpose minus the opposite thing for y. The subscript zero is just uh, our, we need to remove the trace uh, for this to you know, be closer to being in the correct algebra. And then uh, I have uh, the sum through the loops of commutators of aj with its conjugate transpose and same with the, with the b's. And then the corresponding complex moment map uh, sum through the arms of x i y i. So again, you know these are matrices of the right size. I'm going um, going out on y i, coming back on x is something that's r by r. And then I have the commutators of the a j's and b j's, and that gives me my my moment maps. And I want to take the zero level set of these and um, you know mod out this this big polytope by uh, by the S U R action. So I'm going to call this quotient um, X uh, with various symbols around it to remember all the choices that we've made. And so it's really this uh, intersection of level sets uh, modded out. And this gives us a hyperkähler variety whose dimension is related to the dimension of the partial flag varieties and to these uh, matrices that we've added to the center. And if you like, when all the flags are complete, the case that you know, people are typically interested in, uh, the dimension gets this nice form. Now you could ask, you know, what do these, uh, you know, what do the points in this quiver variety represent? And they have a very nice geometric interpretation as uh, polygons because 
really what's happening is if I go back to the, the moment map conditions, um, I have a bunch of, of, vector, of matrices or really if you like vectors living in a vector space uh, that have to close up uh, based on, on being in the zero level set. So I have uh, a sequence of vectors in, in the real algebra and in the complex algebra. And so what I have is a pair of polygons that, that close. And the sides are given by the data on the, uh, on the quiver and the number of sides you can count in terms of N and G. So this lives in SUR or it's dual and this lives in SLR. And so this is why these are referred to as, uh, as uh, hyper polygons. So this is really a moduli space of uh, generalized hyper polygons and we'd say of length alpha because the, the weights that we chose, the Kähler moduli really determine uh, the side lengths of these figures. So these uh, you know, were introduced in the earliest form by Kano and then studied in more detail by Harada and Proudfoot and Godino uh, Mandini and also by um, Jonathan Fisher and myself. So we were interested in the topology of this moduli space when G is equal to zero and we showed that it, uh, we proved that the cohomology ring um, has hyperkähler Kirwan surjectivity and, and worked out the, uh, the rational cohomology. Now, you know, a general comment that Nakajima quiver varieties are in some sense a, a toy model or finite dimensional analog of Hitchin systems. Finite dimensional in the sense that Hitchin systems are, uh, you know, arise from an in, infinite dimensional affine space quotient by a gauge group, whereas these are arising from finite dimensional vector spaces. Now, th both Nakajima quiver varieties and Hitchin systems are semi-projective or if you like circle compact varieties. Um, they have a, you know, very similar topological considerations. They have a core that determines the cohomology or a no potent cone. Um, so, you know, they have a lot in common, but uh, this uh, analogy is, is somehow closest for the star shaped and comet shaped uh, quiver varieties. So he here are the moment map equations again. I've just uh, repackaged them in, in a slightly different way. I've put um, you know, the X and, and A data together and the Y and B da data together on, on this side in the first equation. And, you know, the thing to notice about this equation is, first of all, you know, what I see on the right in the complex equation is, is really the linearization of the key term in, in what defines the character variety of a genus G Riemann surface. So that's the, maybe the first clue as to what's happening here. And, um, you know, if you, if you sort of, you know, stand back from this for a second, you know, the failure of the polygon to close, uh, if you think about the, the, just the X and A data alone, what's happening is the failure of this polygon to close is corrected by our choices of this, in, of this cotangent data, the Ys and the Bs. And that's, that's very similar to the first uh, so-called Hitchin equation. The, the curvature, the failure of, of a unitary connection on a bundle to be flat is, if you like, corrected or measured by the choice of a Higgs field phi, which is really cotangent data. So there's really an analogy between these equations. And then once you see that this is somehow the connection part, and this is somehow the Higgs field part, well, here we have the connection part acting on the cotangent part. And so this second equation is really uh, the analog of, this, of the other Hitchin equation. So that's this one clue that there's, there's more than just an, uh, you know, sort of abstract analogy going on. But, you know, you can construct, uh, in fact, um, a Higgs field directly from the data of a hyperpolygon. So in general, I might take uh, the upper, upper half plane or the, the Poincaré disk and, uh, and tile it with Poincaré regular four G-gons. And what I might do is I might puncture it at endpoints. Um, and this is for genus uh, two, or well, I've already let the cat out of the bag by calling G genus. So, but if you let, uh, you know, G be greater than equal to two, this is precisely what I want to do. But for zero and one, then you might just take the ordinary Euclidean complex plane and, and puncture it. Uh, for G equal to one, maybe, you know, tile it by parallelograms and, and, uh, and puncture it. Uh, and then I want to take this X and and Y data that was going around the center of the quiver and use this to define the residues of a Higgs field-like object. The Higgs field in the same sense as Mikola's uh, talk, except that it's, it's not uh, everywhere holomorphic, it's uh, meromorphic at these punctures. 
But if you choose this, uh, this g, g of z appropriately as a quasi-periodic function, then this quotient will be well-defined on the quotient of the upper half plane by the appropriate uh, Fuchsian group or quotient of c by the lattice for g equal to one, or just as is on, on p1 if g is equal to zero. In other words, we're defining you know, well-defined Higgs fields on uh, Riemann surfaces for, um, let's say, the trivial rank R bundle on those surfaces. And of course, you know, compactify these before you take the quotient. Uh, so we get compact Riemann surfaces. And you know, this, this can be more than, a mer this is a meromorphic case, so there can be more than that. From the alphas, you can cook up parabolic weights in a reasonable way and actually get actually a, an embedding that respects the I-complex structure um, for, um, for, uh, for parabolic Higgs bundles. But not the J and K, they're, they're, these are different hyperkähler structures. So the Nakajima hyperkähler structure is not just a pullback of the Hitchin hyperkähler structure. And it can justify that in, in different ways. And maybe a, a very um, formative example is to take a Dinkin diagram, let's take the affine D4. And um, you know, this is automatically, every flag here is, uh, is complete. So let's take this for some generic choice of alpha uh, for real numbers. And um, you know, this is a non-compact K3 surface, but it fits into the Mackay, Kronheimer, Nakajima correspondence. And in fact, has a, it's a gravitational instanton. It has a complete uh, ALE metric. And it embeds into a corresponding parabolic kitchen system on P1 with, uh, with four punctures, which is also a surface. They actually have a, a complex meaning uh, dimension two over C. They actually have the same dimension and what they differ in is a, a co-dimension uh, zero uh, sub-variety. And uh, that happens to be one point per Hitchin fiber and it's exactly the Hitchin section is what they differ in. And the difference in the hyperkähler structure is you can measure using the hyperkähler metrics. This, the, the variety coming from the star-shaped quiver has an ALE metric. That means that its decay to the Euclidean metric uh, as you go to infinity is order four um, in, in you know, some radial direction, but for the Hitchin system, it's ALG. So it only decays with order two. And that's a very recent result, by the way, of Matzeo uh, or Fredrickson, Matzeo, uh, Svoboda, and Weiss. And the co-dimension grows as you, as you consider other configurations of quiver. And by the way, if you, if you take alpha to be zero, which is sort of non-generic, here, then you will get a, a symplectic singularity. In fact, it's a Kleinian singularity. Now, the last thing I want to talk about um, is uh, you know, integrable systems. So, and the point of view here is somewhat similar to, to Alex's. In fact, I'm going to talk about the same uh, integrable system as, as he did, uh, a gelfand settlin type integrable system. But for those of you who are used to that in the compact case, I mean, this is the non-compact version of it. But really, you know, I want to look at this reduction map that took us from this big product to a uh, hyperpolygon space. And you know, these come with exactly the integrable system that uh, Alex had discussed, which is really you know, appropriately selected matrix, in, uh, matrix invariance. There's a standard Lee Poisson system uh, on this um, Lie algebra. And along this map, um, you know, all of the invariants for these descend. And we want to understand if this remains an integrable system on the quotient. So, you know, if I take, uh, let's, let's make the assumption that we have C many complete arms and the remainder of the arms are, are uh, minimal, uh, just one in R, sort of as short as possible. So we have some mix of these two types of arms. And if I just, for the moment, focus on the, uh, the complete kind, well, you know, there are certain blocks of matrices which are contributing exactly, if you like, Hamiltonians for this, uh, the, these Gelfand settlement systems. So each of these blocks contributes, each of these k by k blocks gives you basically k invariants, which you can interpret as traces. Now I can, I can add up uh, those invariants that I get for each of the C many uh, complete flags. And um, then for the minimal flags, I have a certain, uh, certain number that you can count in a similar, uh, similar fashion. And then I can, I can also count um, basically the cotangent coordinates in the, uh, in the SLRC part. And so I can take this tally and this is sort of the maximal number of uh, invariants that I can have. And now if you roll up your sleeve and, and sort of 
work with the SUR action directly on that big product and understand uh, certain normal forms that, uh, that matrices around the center of the quiver are put into, you understand which, uh, which of these invariants now uh, no longer become algebraically dependent, get fixed or, or basically become functions of one another. And so you can find a, we, so Lauer and I find a, a function uh, for any R, N, G, and C um, that, that uh, is essentially computing the number of, um, of these invariants that are no longer free. And then when you subtract these from the total, you find that you always get half the, uh, the dimension of the moduli space. And so um, what, what remains is, a, is, a, is an integrable system, which you can roughly say is of Gelfand von Settlin type. Uh, but what's interesting about this integrable system is that um, it doesn't see, it, it embeds into a Hitchin system as a, as a sub-integrable system, um, but it does not see the complex geometry of the algebraic curve. It's purely a, a representation theoretic uh, construction. Um, and you get a, a variety of these for different combinations of C, diff different combinations of complete and minimal flags. So you get a hierarchy of these within the Hitchin system. And you know, the work doesn't stop here. You know, we've investigated these hyperpolygons from other points of view, such as mirror symmetry, uh, construction of, of uh, triple brains, um, taking advantage of the hyperkähler structure. But uh, for the purposes of this, I really just wanted to tell you about, the, uh, about this, uh, this integrable system structure and how it relates to the Hitchin system. And that's everything.